Good morning, Duck Church. How y'all doing? Good morning. Good. Thank you guys for being here and coming and worshiping with us and giving you a good message today. Um, let's go ahead and stand up and I'll start us off in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be able to worship you, God, that, that you even created us in your image, God. We screw up, we mess up every day, but um, you still show us your wonderfulness and your joy and your goodness, God, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want standing with us now oh lord unveil our eyes you're the reason we're here
something this morning, like, you know, last week, because I knew I was going to lead worship, but um, this morning, God just said, hey, you need to share this, and so uh, kind of, you know, I planned something else, but God's saying, I need to say this, um, so I was driving this morning uh, across the Currituck Bridge, or, you know, coming from Currituck, and um, I was at the light where the McDonald's is and the Food Lion, where the, the, the marketplace is, and that, that big intersection, and um, I was just sitting at the red light waiting for it to turn green, and there's this truck with a trailer on it with uh, lawn, lawn stuff on it, so this guy's a, a, a lawn care guy, and then a Honda CRV going across the road too, and they just hit each other. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything horrible, but it was just still just, uh, the, the headlight was broken on both cars, and they just nipped each other, and um, just seeing the, the truck you know, go out to the side of the road and the, the car too, and just seeing this big airbag in the CRV go off, and just, um, it was just crazy to see that I was just right there at that same moment. Um, and it just made me think about how our lives can just suddenly change like that, and how you can get in a wreck or um, something happens in your life. And I was just thinking through my head, like, there's moments in our lives where something happens and we're almost devastated. You know, that, that guy who owns his own lawn care business, he's probably not going to be able to work today or for the next few weeks, who knows. Um, 
and so that's not going to help with his business and, you know, keeping maybe his family upkeep. Um, and I just thought about, in my own life, moments like that. And I remember in the seventh grade, sixth grade, sixth grade, uh, it was a year after I'd been done with surgeries and uh, done with uh, this disease called ulcerative colitis. And a year later, my symptoms came back. And I was just kind of, we were kind of confused. We went to the doctors, got a colonoscopy, got some blood work done. And I remember my parents telling me, y you've been misdiagnosed. Y you have Crohn's disease. And hearing the words forever, just remembering, I'm going to have this disease for the rest of my life. I'm going to have to be on drugs for the rest of my life to keep me well. And I remember in that moment, just my whole world was changed. You know, because I thought I was done with it, but forever it got stamped on my life. And so it just seeing that crash, seeing those people and how in that instant something happened. And there's two ways you can go about it. You can either let that defeat you, or you can look to God and see that there's some hope in it. And so Sometimes we have those moments in our lives. I know each one of us has had one of those moments. And all I got to say is Jesus is here to help, you know. And when devastation hits our lives, we can either look, look on hope or look with dread. And so um, I just want to thank God for that. And let's sing, his, let's sing praises to him because we have an awesome God. So let's go ahead and stand.
Father God, thank you so much for being an awesome God, for being a God that helps us in the hard times and gives us hope to look for in the future. Though we may struggle and strife, you're always there and give us a better way out. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want you to greet one another and share the love of Christ.
that you are um, spending your Memorial Day weekend with us and taking a little time out of your vacation to come and worship Jesus. That says a lot about your faith in God, and we're honored by your presence here with us. Um, if you don't mind, on the inside of each um, pew, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, there's a little blue notebook. If you would just sign in and let us know that you're here, that would be awesome. We'd love to know where you're from, um, where you're visiting from. Um, a couple of announcements. On uh, June the 27th, there is a Toby Mac concert. There's a, a little insert in your bulletin about that. Um, he is an awesome Christian music artist. Um, and he's doing a show right here on the Outer Banks down at Festival Park. So if you're here um, for Jan June 27th, uh, the tickets are $20. If you purchase them through the church, we get a little bit of a discount as a group. So if you're interested in going to that concert, um, get the money to me for your tickets by this coming Sunday. And we'll um, for our mission moment this morning, we have a video from Rwanda. Um, our Zoe mission team went to Rwanda back in February, and they visited um, some of the orphans that our church has been sponsoring for the last few years. And this um, young man that you're going to see, his name is Gilbert. Um, he, last year, um, was a brand new orphan in the program. So some of y'all I know went to Rwanda last February, um, and he, in one year, has come such a long way from was to who he is now because of the ways that you've helped to empower him through the zone ministry. So uh, take a look at his story. Okay, his name, Gilbert, is a, a total orphan. He's 15 years old. He cares for four siblings, so there are five in his family. He lost his both parents when he was 10 years old. And to find food for himself and his siblings, he started stealing, to steal food. He will come to <coughs> someone's shop and steal sambusa. He liked the sambusa so much. <laughs> and he was abused because everybody in his community, in his village, they called him, you are the thief. Before he met Zoe, he had been taken to prison three times at his young age. Then after just one, one month, Later, after he was released from prison, he heard about Zoe, and then they received the India group. They received the training on income generating activity, how to to start a, a small business. And then after that, he received a grant, and uh, because he loved the samosa so much, and uh, he watched it many times people making the samosa, and he said. That would be my project. And uh, he thought about a big idea, not only selling one piece by one, to be a wholesaler. The people who are working for him now are those men who used to make sambusa before, and they stole from them. They became friends, they were in the heat. In my nature, I'm not a thief, and I want you to forgive me if you accept to come and work with me. He want to thank also that church, EMC, because he knows that whatever his, whatever is making his life different from the past was from that church. So just in one year, you see this guy who used to be a thief, um, actually making a business and then asking the people he was stealing from to come and work for him. That's a crazy turn of events, isn't it? And now Gilbert is not only able to support himself, but also his four siblings. They're back in school. Um, and even, I think he said, um, in just a month, he had earned enough money from his business to buy a plot of land to be able to build a house. That's crazy. In just one month of work, he was able to do that. So imagine what it's going to be like when he's done with the three-year program. Um, if you would like to be a part of this ministry that's life-changing, God is doing an incredible work through Zoe's ministry. Um, it only costs $350 to put one child through that entire three-year program. Um, and uh, if you want to do that, there are these little cards in the back of the pew. Um, and you can pay all the money now, or if you want to, you can just pay it by the end of the year. We're about halfway towards reaching our goal of sponsoring 225 orphans this year. So thank you for doing that if you feel led by the Lord to do it. If the ushers would come forward, we'll receive um, 
of God's tithes and offerings.
Distinguished Preachers series. Our pastor, John, is on sabbatical. Um, he's been on sabbatical for about five weeks now, and he's got about five more weeks to go. And so we've had the privilege of welcoming some incredible pastors and teachers and speakers to share what the Lord has put on their heart. And this morning, um, we have Elaine Heath, who is here with us. She is the dean of Duke Divinity School. Um, she's written lots of things that you can read about um, in the little insert there if you're interested in that. But she has a word from the Lord this morning to share with us. So let's give her a hand as she comes forward to share. Thank you. Good morning. I was looking at your carpet and thinking to myself, if you take Duke blue and you mix it together with Carolina blue, you get this blue which is either dreadful or it's a sign that you believe in reconciliation. So, something like that. So. <laughs> no, it's a lovely church. <laughs> I'm reading from Philippians chapter 2. This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a little house church in, in a town called Philippi, and he wrote it from prison. So I'm going to have that context for you. And this uh, scripture that we're going to read is one of the earliest praise songs of the church. And uh, it's, it's, so that's interesting. We've been singing some beautiful praise songs. I really appreciate the spirit of the band. You can, you can feel the, uh, the Holy Spirit coming through the music and calling our hearts to worship. So thank you. Um, so this was an early praise song of the church. It's one of the earliest recorded praise songs we have of the church. And it, it guides us to notice how God reveals God's self through Christ and invites us to align ourselves with that God, the God who looks like Jesus, who acts like Jesus. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. So that part is kind of the prelude or the, the, the early introduction to the song, and here's the song now. Let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he was equal with God, did not consider equality something to exploit, but empty himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is God's word to us today, this early praise song of the church. So I was a newly minted pastor in 1995, fresh out of seminary, and I was... I was proud of how I had worked hard in seminary. I was valedictorian of my class. I won lots of awards for my academic achievements and so on and so forth. <laughs> and uh, I was especially proud of my grades and my achievements because I grew up in poverty in a violent home. I left home when I was 16. And uh, I didn't get to go to college right away. It's a miracle. I, went, I graduated high school, to be honest. So I went to school later in life, and I was raising my children and working at Joanne Fabric Store and going to college, and still raising my children and working uh, at a small, uh, on a small youth pastor sort of position in the church and going to seminary. So, so this is how I got through school, right? It took a long time. And, uh, and my, my uh, desire was never to live in that kind of environment again, where there's violence and poverty and you're not safe, and you have to hide, and people are addicted, and all kinds of stuff, right? So now here I am, a newly minted pastor, 1995, and where does the bishop send me? East Liverpool, Ohio. <laughs> Ohio River Valley. 
Maybe some of you have been in the Ohio River Valley. At one time, it was booming with industry. Steel mills built by Andrew Carnegie. Um, potteries. Anybody out there have fiesta wear? We have fiesta wear at our house. And uh, it, it was made right there in the Ohio River Valley. Paul China, Ohio River Valley. All these uh, manufacturing um, companies and uh, people could earn a good living, a middle class living, and raise your kids and have a good life in the Ohio River Valley. And then outsourcing happened. Do you remember this period of history, some of you? Uh, outsourcing is the dark underbelly of unchecked capitalism. Outsourcing happened when people decided that making a profit, regardless of the cost to our economy, regardless of the cost to our communities, regardless of the cost to children, to disadvantaged people, that making a profit was Almighty God. Then we had outsourcing. And then you had, one by one, steel mills downsizing, closing, potteries downsizing, closing, uh, good industry, furniture manufacturers downsizing, closing. And those booming towns along the Ohio River Valley became husks of towns shells of towns that began to uh, crumble right into the earth. And East Liverpool, Ohio, I was in the worst neighborhood in that town on the Ohio River Valley that was like that, uh, years after the downsizing and the outsourcing had begun. So I lived in a house on the main drag. I was serving three little Appalachian churches. This is the northern tip of Appalachia. If you read Hillbilly Elegy, anybody read that book? You must go read it immediately after church. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, this, that my family comes. I come from that kind of a background with Appalachian folks who migrated north to get jobs in industry. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing story. So I'm there. I'm living in this house, and I'm serving these three little rural churches, but I'm living in town in this house in the worst neighborhood in one of the in, in East Liverpool. A few blocks from the house that I lived in, there was a toxic waste incinerator. So uh, toxic waste was shipped in from all over everywhere, and they would burn it at night. There were smokestacks with, uh, with chemical plants. Now there were chemical plants where there used to be steel mills. Now there are chemical plants pumping toxins into the air from those smokestacks. The air was so bad that the paint would fall off your walls on the outside of your house. And regardless of all the activism that had gone on, even some movie stars had gone as activists to try to shut down that toxic waste incinerator because it was right by an elementary school, uh, all the activism resulted in no change. The Environmental Protection Agency said, oh no, that air is clean enough to breathe. This is what always happens when there's uh, poverty, and then there's environmental destruction, and, and it creates a cycle where the poor are the ones who suffer the most from environmental destruction. I remember talking to an emergency room uh, nurse who told me that they could always tell when there was this one thing, this mysterious substance being burned, because it happened on a cyclical basis, because the emergency room would be flooded with people who couldn't breathe. I learned that there was a, a lung condition in East Liverpool that didn't even have a name, where the lung, lungs begin to crystallize because of that air. So there I was in this hellish neighborhood, living in that house, serving these three little Appalachian churches. Now something happened in my family that was quite devastating. And I was home alone, I had the doors and windows closed, didn't want that air to come in the house. And I was very devastated. I was feeling alone. Did you know that pastors feel lonely sometimes? Who does the pastor go to when the pastor has a devastating event in their family? I just felt alone. Uh, I felt God forsaken. And uh, I, I, I was living in this town that was so full of despair and illness. So I was in my house and I was weeping because of this event in my family. Uh, not ladylike weeping where you have a pink tissue and you dab at the corner of your eyes and gently sniffle your nose. No, I was wailing. I was wailing 
Did you ever cry so hard you feel like your heart is physically breaking? You feel like you're being torn apart. It was like that. All of a sudden, I hear this pounding on the door, somebody with a fist pounding on my front door and would not stop pounding. I just froze. I did not want to go to that door. I did not want to go, but the pounding wouldn't stop. So I mopped my face off. I was all swollen. I could, uh, my sinuses are blocked. You know how it is when you cry like that. I go to the door. I open it up. And it's the woman that lives in the crack house right behind the house where I lived. She lived there, active drug user, probably a prostitute. I had met her a few times on the street, just kind of coming and going. So I knew her name, but I didn't know her. She's at the door. And she says to me, Honey, are you all right? I was walking by and I heard you. And she looks around me, she's looking in. She had fire in her eyes. She was going to hurt whoever was hurting me. It was the most amazing moment because despite all of my education and my own personal journey out of all of the stuff I'd endured, and despite all of that, Despite all my theological reading and my reading of the Bible many times, and I could read it in Greek, and I could read it in Hebrew, and I could parse the verbs, and all that, I could do all that. It had not occurred to me that it was possible for Jesus to come and speak to me through a woman that lives in the crack house who sells her body and uses drugs. I didn't think that was possible. That was beyond my imagination. But Jesus did come and speak to me through her, and Jesus said to me in her voice, standing on my door, pounding on my door, Honey, are you okay? Jesus there saying, I'm with you. I hear you. You are not alone. Well, that began to disturb my theological world. <laughs> and where my thoughts about what it meant to be blessed in the past had been blessing means being comfortable. Oh, we're so blessed. We have a nice home. We're so blessed our child got into college. We're so blessed. You know how we talk about being blessed. And I ever so slowly began to think about how being blessed means, no, honey, are you all right? I am with you. Peering over to see what's going on in the house of my life. <laughs> but that's what blessed means. And I began to think differently about my neighborhood where I lived, this hellish neighborhood where people can't breathe and the paint falls off the walls and most people are on welfare and I have a crack house kind of in my backyard. I began to think differently about that. But there was another thing that happened in that same house, in that same driveway, just not very long after I had this encounter with my neighbor. I was out in the driveway pondering life. What am I doing here? I heard this weird tapping noise. Tap, 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 tap. Now, as my husband could tell you, I'm a little bit OCD. <laughs> so, <laughs> a strange noise, a strange sound, something that's not supposed to be there, the door slightly ajar, the cupboard's not closed. I need to go fix it. I've got to find out what that noise is, and I can't rest until I do. I mean, that's just my tortured world, right? <laughs> Anybody out there like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. So I hear this noise, and I'm like, what is that noise? It's coming from the garage. So I go to the garage, a big old two-story detached garage. It has a window that's round like that window, but about half the size of it. And that's the only light that goes into the attic of the garage. Filthy window, all that dirty air. I go into the garage. I go up that dark staircase. I get up there, and lo and behold, there's a cardinal, a male cardinal, running its head into that window trying to get out. So apparently it had flown in when the door was open, and it had flown somehow. Up. I don't know why it went up to the dark attic, but it went up. And now it was trapped in that attic. And it would either die from head trauma <laughs> or starvation or, or thirst because it was trapped. It, it, you know, that bird could not imagine how to find freedom by going down. Finding salvation from that trapped place by going down was not in its little brain. 
All it could think about was trying to run its head through that window to get outside and find freedom, to be saved from its stuck place. Well, I love animals, and I couldn't bear to see that bird trapped like that, so I was going to go try to shepherd it toward the stairway so it could go down, and I, I went toward it with my arms out, and of course all it could see was a monster coming. <laughs> so then I thought I'm going to have to do something else. So I went and got the fishing net, the kind with the telescoping handle, and then you reach out there and you get the bass out of the pond when you've been fishing. And I crept up on that bird ever so slowly. Crept up, crept up like this, just a little bit at a time. And then I snatched the bird, <laughs> caught it in that net, and took it down that dark staircase. And just as I was opening the net out in the driveway so the bird could fly free, there's this moment where the bird stopped struggling. It realized it was outside. And as that bird took flight, it was one of those moments we have a few times where in our deep, deepest self, in our soul, in our heart, we have a moment of understanding what kind of God God really is. We, we, we get it. It was my moment to understand the words of this hymn, this early praise song. That though he was equal with God, he did not consider his equality, he did not consider his status, his high and mighty place, something to exploit, but emptied himself and went down to lead us out to salvation. I understood in a deep and visceral level that Christ loves us so much he cannot bear to be away from us and cannot bear to see us stuck. I understood that God would do anything it took to set us free and that nothing would be able to stop God because that's what God is going to do. And that love drives God. Love is God's meaning. I understood it. And that bird was all of humanity being set free by the love of Christ that leads him down to lead us out. In the early church, uh, they, they started creating icons in the Orthodox Church, and their, their images, you've seen icons with the halos around the people, right? There's one that is the icon of the resurrection. We just finished Easter season. We're now in Pentecost season in the liturgical year of the church. And this icon is, um, here's Jesus Here's Jesus, and he has, uh, in the words of the Apostles' Creed, do you ever use that creed in this service? Probably not. Are you familiar with the Apostles' Creed? Nod your heads if you are. Okay. All right. Earliest baptismal creed of the church. It's what people learned so they could be baptized and be prepared for martyrdom because it was dangerous to be a Christian in those early years. So this icon uh, has part of the story that's in the Apostles' Creed. So here's Jesus. He has descended into hell. That's in the early Apostles' Creed. It says he died and was buried, and he descended to hell. If you look at the Methodist hymnal, they took that line, he descended to hell, and they said, we don't know what to make of this. We'll just put it in a footnote, and they just took it out. <laughs> what were they thinking? Really? I want that line to stay there. I want Jesus to come and pound on my door when I'm devastated and tell me, honey, I hear you. Don't take away that line. Here's this icon. Here's Jesus. Here's uh, a broken casket. Here's a broken casket. He has a man here and a woman here. He's pulling them up out of death. This is Adam and Eve. They represent all of humanity, corporate humanity. And as Jesus is rising from the dead, after he descended into hell, he's rising up out of hell. He's got them by the hands. They have those golden nimbuses around their head, which means they're holy. They belong to God, and he's pulling them right out of hell with him. He goes, descends to hell to pull them right up out of hell with him. And I love that icon. Underneath his feet is a personification of death and hell, and it's this grumpy old man with a white beard. Sorry, every man with white beards. <laughs> it's this cranky-looking old man with a white beard, and he's been kind of tied up and put in chains, and he's down there, and he, he just doesn't get to run things around anymore. Jesus descended into hell to pull us up and pull us out. 
In her book, Christianity After Religion, Diana Butler Bass talks about the word believe, that word that we use in the Apostles' Creed when we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, she says that in Middle English, Middle English, that's the language of the hobbits, right? <laughs> All those guys. No, that, wait, that's Middle Earth, right? <laughs> in Middle English, the word believe actually is beloved. Beloved. And if we trace out the meaning of that word, it actually means not an intellectual assent. It's not agreeing to a list of propositions. It means to love and trust. To love and trust. And how different the Apostles' Creed reads when we say, I love and trust God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. I love and trust Jesus Christ the Son. I love and trust the Holy Spirit. That's way different than I agree with a set of doctrines. It's so much more intense. I love and trust means I want to be with you, Father, Son, and Spirit. I want you to be with me, Father, Son, and Spirit. I trust you, so I'm going to be open and vulnerable to you. And wherever you go, I want to be there. Whatever you're doing, I want to be a part of it. I don't ever want to be away from you in any way. I want to fully align myself with what you're up to in the world. I love and trust. So the question for us today is, what does it mean to love and trust Jesus who descended into hell? To love and trust the descent into hell. What an odd question. But we cannot love and trust Jesus Christ if we don't love and trust that. By the way, that he descended into hell. That's not something people made up for a good story. It's actually in the Bible. <laughs> it's in there. Where's Waldo? You can find it later. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, we saw a video of this boy, uh, Gideon, Gilbert. Gilbert, this 15-year-old boy who was the sole provider for several of his siblings who was living in a hell of being an orphan, of having to steal food and then being arrested and put in jail repeatedly for stealing food so that his siblings didn't starve. That was a hell. And people like this church partnered financially with some people with boots on the ground there in his community, worked together and created a means to go down and lead him out of that hell so that he now has a small business. And I love that he hired the people that used to have him arrested. Isn't that great? <laughs> Talk about reconciliation. And now he has a business, and he can provide for his family. What is the hell? Jesus asked his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, he says, hey, who do they say I am? What are they saying on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram? What's the word in the street? And his disciples start saying, well, some people say you're Jeremiah. Some people say you're Elijah. Some people say John the Baptist. Which is weird, because all three of those were dead guys by the time they're saying it's right. These are all dead guys. And what they were saying was, well, you've got that prophetic spirit of Jeremiah, and you have that evangelistic zeal of John. And Elijah, you've got that mysterious fire and capacity and so they're saying these things, and Jesus says, but Peter, who do you say I am? Really put him on the spot. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Which meant you are the one we've been waiting for, the divine one, the Savior. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Sina, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, because this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by your heavenly Father. And your name is Peter, Petrus, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. What is the rock upon which the church will be built so that the gates of hell cannot prevail? <laughs> it's not the rock of Peter. Jesus was using a little wordplay. He was a jokester at times. Peter. Your, na your name's not going to be Simon. Your name's going to be Peter, Petrus, the rock. 
like Dwayne Johnson, right? Pretty buff guy. No, the rock is what has been revealed to us in Jesus about who God is, what God is up to. Jesus shows us what God is really like. Jesus is the image, the perfect image of the unseen God. And that understanding, that revelation that's given to us, that's what, that's what generates the church against which hell cannot prevail. The revelation that comes to us when we're standing in our house in a rotten neighborhood, weeping and feeling alienated, and somebody's pounding on the door, and it turns out to be Jesus talking to us. You are not alone. I hear you. Are you all right, honey? When I read that text and I think about my life and the life of many other people that I know, I think about our journeys. The gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell. So I'm thinking about these gates of hell. Gates of hell. And sometimes, for some reason, Christians seem to think that the gates of hell are something like, I'll just use this as a hypothetical, not that this church is hell, okay, you understand that. But, but we've got some doors that look kind of like gates, right? <laughs> Those doors. And sometimes we think that uh, the not prevailing is us, us pushing through to get out somewhere. We're going to get out of something. Like, we're in hell and we're going to get out of that kind of thinking. It's not actually what it says. The gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus is describing something like a gated community. Do you have those around here? You know what they are. Nice neighborhoods, gates. If they're really super duper nice, you even have a person in a little guardhouse that keeps an eye on everybody coming and going. And why do we do that? We're going to keep out the riffraff, right? Keep out East Liverpool. The whole city can't even come in. That, that's completely outside of the gates. <laughs> Jesus is kind of describing something like a, a gated community. And there's something about a group of Christians who actually have had this experience, this revelation of who Jesus really is and what kind of God God really is, who've had this experience and their hearts are changed, their lives are changed. And they know, they know who Jesus is and are really devoted to following that real Jesus, that that community that is like that will go find hell and break down the gates and go into the hell, will go there on purpose, will go and live there and inhabit the neighborhood. And what will happen then is that neighborhood will encounter the saving love of God and it won't be stuck anymore. And people won't be stuck anymore, will not be trapped anymore, will not be running their heads into the window anymore, but will find the way out with God's help. The mission of the church is really to go to hell. <laughs> now, sometimes when we live in nice communities like this one or where my husband and I live, it's easy for us to start thinking, oh, that, that, that the hellish kind of neighborhoods, that's where Gilbert lives, over there somewhere. We're here and we're blessed, and Gilbert is over there and is not blessed and lives in this sort of hellish condition. We think that. But I promise you, there are pockets of hell all over this town, too. Did you know that there's no difference statistically between, if you look at, if you look at statistics for domestic violence and sexual violence, it's no different in affluent communities than it is in really poor communities. It's just as bad where you've got doctors and lawyers and you've got um, professional people who earn a really good income. It's just as bad there as it is where people live in a tar paper shack and they have single parents and all that kind of stuff. It's just as bad. It's sometimes harder to work on it to help people become free of the abuse because the persons who are doing the abusing have all kinds of money and power at their disposal to keep things the way they are. There are pockets of hell all around us. There are people who are suffering with addictions people who are being driven by shame because of something that happened when they were 10 years old, people who feel empty even though they have plenty of material wealth, people who keep making the same bad choice over and over in who they marry. They keep marrying an alcoholic and then it goes bad and they get divorced and then they marry another one. Just change the name, same story. All around there are pockets of hell. And the church's mission is to break down those gates live there, to go down, 
participate with God revealed in Christ, to go down and leave people out. We do that by being neighbors. Loving with the love of Jesus, we go down and out. This is what it means not just to sing this early hymn of the church, but to let it sing in us and to sing us into oneness with what God is up to in this world.
It's your breath.